is holy. You are to bless the Lord, oh, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy, 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 His holy. Welcome to Reseda Church of Christ as we begin our worship service. If you are visiting with us today in the audience, we just want to let you know that you're an honored guest and we are glad that you are here with us today. And then if you're on Zoom or online, welcome to the Cyber Sanctuary, all right? If you could take out your bulletins, we're going to go through the call to worship. Front page. And please repeat after me. Come, let us sing joy to the Lord. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. For he is our God, our, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Amen. Amen. We shall assemble on the mountain. We, we shall assemble at the throne with humble heart into his presence. We bring an offering of song as we say glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb and to the King. Oh hallelujah, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, oh, we sing the song of the king. You say we, we shall, shall assemble on the mountain, say we, we shall assemble, assemble at the throne. We humble heart into his presence, we bring an offering of song, an offering of song. Glory and honor and dominion to the Lamb, unto the King, unto the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. We sing the song of the redeemed. We sing the song of the redeemed. Say we. We sing the song of the redeemed. For the waters of my soul longs after you. You, you alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I 
I want you more than gold or silver. I want you more than gold. Only you can satisfy. Only you can satisfy. You are the real joy giver. I have a Father, we come before your throne. Father, thank you, Father, for this day that you've allowed us once again to come out and to worship you in spirit and in truth, dear Father. We thank you, Father, for everyone that is gathered here today. And we ask that you surround us with your powerful, life-changing presence, Father. Thank you, Father. We thank you for loving us, Father, and calling us to walk with you. We come before you as we meet and declare our dependence on you, Father, because you are our God. We ask, Father, that you would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask, Father, that you would fill our hearts with your love, fill, fill your words and conversation with truth and grace. We ask these in all things in praise and adoration to you, Father. In Christ's name we do pray. Let us all together say amen. amen. For those of you who are sports enthusiasts, how many of you are sports enthusiasts? Y'all know what's, uh, what, what calling an audible is. In the middle of a play, you got to yield sometime to your quarterbacks, amen? amen? How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Oh, see how great. How great. Is our, our God. Let's try it again. As they enter, we say, How great, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Let all see how great. Say, How great. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. Come on, clap your hands. He rides himself in light. And the darkness tries to hide. Yes, he trembles at his voice. He trembles at 
Jesus for us. Everybody say, how great, say, how great. Talk about your God. Say, sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, God. Your God, 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 Julius, come on, God. God, sing, baby. By the Spirit, so shed. By the Spirit, it's the lion and the lamb. The lion and the lamb. Today she's been, she's had surgery. There are people that have been here who've been very sick. And they stand today to say how great their God is. And they sing praises to him for what he has done. Because he's done marvelous things, amen. Hmm. I sing praises to your name. Oh Lord, praises to your name. Providential watch care. It is greater and greater. 
so thankful that we have a, uh, an entity, a being that we can call on for help. Lord, we're so grateful for you sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and giving word, his living words to help us in each and every single day of our life. Father, you alone are, are worthy. You deserve all the praise. We don't have enough praise to offer to you, Lord. At this time, we just want to set aside everything that might be plaguing us in our lives yeah. and focus on our creator, yeah. our sustainer of life, yeah. our deliverer, our conqueror, Lord, yeah. all of that. We thank you. Yes, God. Father God, we pray that nothing done in this service will be hindered by our own faults or shortcomings. Well, we just want to call upon your name this morning, Lord. We thank you and we love you. In his name we do pray. Let us all say amen. I stand here in the place of one of our associates, Brother Lamaya, who is not feeling well, and so he went back home. I want you to pray for him. We're transitioning into the portion of service that focuses upon fellowship. We refer to it as the koinonia, a word that is used uh, very uniquely in the New Testament to refer to the communion of saints, the type of relationships that God has designed for believers to have with the body of Christ. It is the koinonia. 
And there is a portion of worship that focuses upon that that relationship. It's called fellow. We translate it fellowship, communion, fellowship. And as we prepare for that, we're going to be blessed with a song of meditation to focus our hearts upon fellowship. I know it was the blood I know it was the blood I know it was the blood for me One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. service focuses in two directions. The first direction is what was accomplished at the cross of Christ, which is the fellowship that we now experience called the church. And so it is the body of Christ. The 
Bible says we focus upon the purity of that sacrifice uh, that in our relationships to one another, we are to emulate. So the Bible said, let us keep the feast, not with the leaven of wickedness and malice. That is those things that break relationships. So as we focus upon fellowship and we find in our hearts, uh, we find in our relationship to, to, to each other that there is brokenness, there's malice, there's guile. Then the Bible says we leave our gifts at the altar and go and reconcile ourselves first to our brother or our sister. Then come and offer your gift. He's saying you cannot be in fellowship with God and out of fellowship with your brother and sister whom you see every day. So at this time, we're going to focus upon the bread. We ask you to uncover uh, the unleavened bread in the container. Hold it in your hands. As Brother Ross will give thanks for the bread. Shall we pray? Holy and righteous Father God, we just want to say thank you for the sacrifice that you did on the cross, Father. We just ask that, Father, that you bless our hearts and our minds, that we are able to take this bread in a holy manner that is pleasing and acceptable unto your sight. We just pray, Father, that you help us to examine our relationships with you, Lord, and with one another within the church. And it's these things I ask in your son's name, I pray. Amen. Secondly, we are to focus upon our fellowship with the one who died and sacrificed his life in order that we might have a right relationship with God. Through the death of Christ as our substitute, then God forgives all of our sins and we stand before him blameless, holy, and without blame in his sight. And when we partake of this bread, we literally examine our commitment to him who died that we might live. At this time, I'm going to ask Brother Mitchell to give thanks for the cup. Father, we thank you for your unconditional love, the love that a father has for his children. We thank you, O oh God, for your son who came and died on our behalf so that we might receive everlasting life. God, we thank you for this cup, which is your son's shed blood, and we always take it in remembrance of him and the great, great sacrifice that was made. So on that, dear Father, we ask that you bless us, keep us in your care, and the saints all together say amen. Amen. You may now take up the cup.
think that child is saying hallelujah, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. Wonderful. There is a worshipful response to the work of Christ on the cross that also goes in a horizontal and a vertical direction. And that is called giving, two forms of giving. The first form of giving is where we show our partnership with Christ uh, in his ministry and mission by returning the first fruit of our income to the Lord, is often referred to in, throughout scripture as tithing. When Jacob entered into covenant with the Lord, he says, if the Lord will do all the things that he has promised for me, I will surely bring to him the tithe. And so we do that even today, as the Apostle Paul said, it is the means by which believers not only demonstrate saving faith in the Lord, but also the willingness to be identified with his ministry and mission. This time we're going to ask Brother Ross, if he will, to give thanks uh, for the tithe. Shall we pray? Father, we just want to thank you for blessing us with this opportunity just to demonstrate our love for you and for the faith of the community of Righteous God. And we just ask that, Father, that we are able just to tithe, Father, with out of a reluctant heart. We just pray that, Father, that it will be pleasing and acceptable unto your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a second aspect of giving that relates to the bounty of God. That is the abundance of God's grace that is shown toward us every week that we never anticipated. God says, when you give, it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, running over, shall men give into your bosom. And when God does that, then he expects a response of gratitude on our part. And that's the aspect of giving that is often referred to as offering. And an offering, because it is gratitude, the Bible says it cannot be commanded. It is a demonstration of one's love. And it's a respect, an acknowledgement that God has done for you more than you expected. And so when God does this, then, then we tithe on the offering. That is, whatever that gift is that God gave us that we didn't anticipate it. It wasn't even in our budget, but God gave it to us anyway. Isn't that right? And so we give out of that because uh, God is good and his grace is bountiful, bountiful, whatever that word is. <laughs> Abundant is the word. And so we want to give thanks at this time for every offering uh, that is offered out of sincerity today. And Brother Mitchell is going to give thanks for the offerings. Our heads are bowed. Father, you've blessed us. You've given us everything that we needed, dear Father, and all that we didn't deserve. You've been so good to us, Father. We just say thank you for that. We ask right now, dear God, that you bless this overflow of blessings, that it may be a blessing to someone else, that this offering will be touched to help a ministry or someone who may be in need. So, dear Lord, just bless this overflow love offering. We ask this. Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. There are four ways that you can participate in giving. It is demonstrated on the screens below. Uh, and that is you can, uh, there's in-person giving that you may be doing here in this sanctuary today with the gold and the white envelopes. Uh, there's online giving that you just go to the Reseda website and, and press on the Give tab and it'll give you instructions. You can text with your cell phones the church number uh, and just put in the box, the text message box, a dollar amount, and, it, and you will receive guidance. And then you can sell the church finance team, receipt of finance team at gmail.com. You can do uh, either one of those areas to participate, you know, in the giving aspect of this worship.
to stand at this time we conclude our cornelia uh, focus by allowing you to experience fellowship with one another and that is find somebody in the audience that you don't know introduce yourself and give them a hearty welcome to the receded church greet that person that you haven't seen in a while and uh, show the hospitality of the receded congregation The children at this time will, will be going over to children's worship, the children's Bible hour, unless I've, I'm given instructions otherwise. Yes, I am. Oh, 
Oh yeah. into the presence in the throne room of God and prepare our hearts that we may offer the sacrifices of praise and thanksgivings that are acceptable to him through Jesus Christ. At this time, I'm going to ask Sam if he'd come forward. Come on, come on, Sam Hardy, Brother Hardy. I want to I do something. Uh, come on up on the stage, Sam. I want you to know. Would you be quiet? <laughs> Mark got Mark is so excited that he got on it yesterday at EPE, and uh, aren't you aren't you excited? You know, for him, thank God for him. Thank God for his ministry and the impact uh, that is recognized all over our brotherhood in terms of what uh, Mark has accomplished uh, in Praise Team Ministry. I bring Sam up because Sam is the minister of one of our daughter churches. And I see members of that church here, here today. Isn't that right? They, they've come down to be with us. And, and, and I'm so glad. If I had known all that was going on, maybe we could have made some adjustments. <laughs> but Sam is, Sam is a gospel preacher. He's excited about evangelism. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to have him here. And members of the AV, the 
that is the Antelope Valley Church of Christ is with us today. Would you, would you like to just say a few words, Sam? It's just good to be here uh, where I have some history at and appreciate Brother Dr. Winrow for everything he has uh, poured into me uh, over the years, the, the good and uh, also the challenging times, amen? But it has also, all has been, all has contributed to my growth. And I'm just so appreciative for your work, my brother. Appreciative uh, for the receded Church of Christ uh, that you're here. And we're able to prosper and we're able to be what we are because of, number one, God. But God has worked through members that have uh, come from receded, uh the Vine Street Church of Christ. That's why I asked my brother James to come up here. He's been with us from day one. You know, he, this is his home. This is his home. But he has blessed us in many ways, and uh, a lot of that is uh, due to you. Amen. And I just want to take one more minute, just ask uh, our brothers and sisters from the AV Church of Christ. Some came out with us. Just all stand up. Can everybody just stand up? <laughs> amen. 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 So it's good to be here. Hey, keep up the work, Doc. Uh, we have Brother Carl and many of the members that used to be here. Uh, they, they are very instrumental to our uh, ministry out in the AV Church of Christ, and we're so happy and thankful. So keep up the good work, Doc. All right. Thank you very much. You know, that, that, that was one of our potential worship leaders, Brother James Rogers there. He loves the same. And uh, he's been a blessing not only to this church, but also to the church in the Antelope Valley. And I'm glad uh, that Sam is with us today and members of the uh, Antelope Valley congregation uh, it lets this church know, you know, what God is doing, not only in you, but through you. Isn't that right? And so I, I would not dare pass by that opportunity to show the fruit, you know, of this ministry. And uh, we want to be even more responsive uh, in the future than we've been in the past, you know, to the development and the developing work uh, in that area. I know you've seen all of this. This is new to you. It wasn't here last week, uh, but it's not on, and that's why we had to use these makeshift st screens. We went and got TVs out of the classrooms so you can see some graphics. <laughs> uh, we thought that the, that the uh, video wall, this is what is called a video wall, uh, and it will serve the purposes of what uh, we had been using in the past, which was scroll down screens. They have been removed, so we got caught in between. You know, we had been assured that the screen would be ready for this Sunday, and and uh, they ran into some, to some technical difficulties, so they'll come back tomorrow and complete it. Uh, and in the meantime, you can watch these large screen TVs <laughs> that we put up here. That's, this is not permanent. You know, they're just laying up here against these, these uh, stands so that you can see the scriptures that we will utilize uh, in our message today. Uh, so this is just a make, makeshift operation right now until we transition to this, this video wall that stands behind me. God has blessed this congregation and he's been continuously blessing us real good. His mercy endures forever. We're also getting, uh, getting geared up, but we want you to be aware of this, that we're gearing up for a conference that we are, will be hosting and conducting uh, here, one at the Reseda Congregation and also at the Airtel Plaza Hotel uh, in March 21 through 23. And we're asking our members to register uh, in advance because that is uh, well, we need you to register in advance, and if you're going to be utilizing the hotel for stay, you certainly need to register because those rooms are limited, you know, in terms of availability. So keep in mind that this workshop, this conference is designed to impact the church completely. Every vital aspect of ministry is going to be addressed uh, in this church training and development conference. We're working in collaboration uh, with Fuller Theological Seminary in terms of dealing with youth uh, and the initiative that has been sponsored uh, by the Lilly Foundation to help curb the number of teens that are leaving the Christian faith uh, 
annually. Almost a million youth every year are leaving the church not to return. And so we're in collaboration to curb that situation and address that situation. And we are training and preparing youth workers and youth leaders. That's one of the objectives of this, of this workshop is to train and prepare young people to be capable of reaching youth in their congregations as well as in the community and do it effectively. You know, so uh, all that is needed and provided, all that is needed is being provided, you know, through uh, this initiative that is called 10 by 10, 10 by 10. Pepperdine is going to be conducting a, a workshop uh, that deals with locating the next generation of preachers. Isn't that something? In other words, they want to find young people who are interested in preaching the gospel, you know, and and share that vision and cast the vision to these young people. If you're interested in becoming a preacher, if God has gifted you with particular gifts and you want to cultivate those gifts and you feel that God may be calling you in this direction, uh, then there will be a workshop that is provided uh, for the next generation of gospel preachers. Last week, we we initiated a series that we have not really formulated a, a real description of it, but I just call it getting it all together. You know, let's get it together. And uh, the beginning of every year, we have the opportunity to reassess and reevaluate where we are in terms of our calling, in terms of God's calling uh, in our lives. And therefore, because the year repeats itself over and over again, it's called anniversaries, uh, God does this because there are times that we need to reassess, that we need to reevaluate, that we need to reset, you know, reset our lives, recenter our lives. Uh, because in order to become all that God wants us to be, uh, we need our hearts to be focused upon Christ and what he provides and what he does and what he accomplishes and what he wants to accomplish uh, in and through us. So last week we began with the message, making a faith commitment, making a faith commitment for your family. And we took off from Joshua, the 24th chapter, where Joshua, when they entered into the land of promise, Joshua challenged the people. He says, you need to decide whether or not it is a good thing, whether or not it is honorable to serve the God uh, that our fathers served. And he says, uh, whether you're going to serve the gods of the land, are you going to engage in the idolatry of your foreparents uh, in the wilderness? He said, but choose you this day whom you're going to serve. He said, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Uh, that, that statement is profound because Joshua literally was making a faith commitment on behalf of his family. Not everybody, not every parent, not every head of household is capable of speaking for their family. Uh, and, and you need to understand that God placed you, if you're a parent, God has placed you in your family and God has placed you in your immediate family and your extended family for a purpose. And that's why the Christian life and salvation is referred to and described as a vessel. The Bible said we are vessels of life. That means we are containers that other people can come and based upon what God places in you, in your heart, and in your spirit, and in your soul, they can become partakers of that. When the Bible speaks of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Bible calls it a river of water that God places in the heart of a believer that does not, is not self-contained there. He said, he that believeth in me out of his inner parts shall flow rivers of living water. Out of his inner parts shall flow rivers of living water. And he said, this he spake concerning the Holy Spirit, that they that believe on him should receive. 
That is, the Holy Spirit is not simply designed to dwell within you. It is a gift that God has given to flow out of you. And therefore, you are a contributory of life. You're not like the Dead Sea, as we pointed out. Uh, the Dead Sea only receives from, from tributaries. But there are no outlets in the Dead Sea, and that's why it's called the Dead Sea, because nothing can live in the Dead Sea. Everything that comes into it stays in it. And therefore, the saline content is, is, uh, is so great that you can't even drown in the Dead Sea. You can just float. You can't swim, just go there and float. Because nothing can drown in that sea. Everything is dead. And God does not pour rivers of life into your life in order for it to remain there and become stale. Know that. God wants you to be a tributary of life to others. And so today we're going to talk about getting your life recentered in the way that God has intended it to be. I want to talk about the recentering of your heart, developing a heart for the Lord. And I'm going to utilize a text from Colossians, the first chapter of the second chapter, verses 1 to 7. To talk about what it means to have a recentered heart. Notice, uh, and I'm hearing echoes now, uh, but, but notice the description first of a recentered life. Because what a recentered heart produces is a Christ centered life. And I want to give you the features that come out of literally the development of the theme in Colossians. The book of Colossians is about the all-sufficiency of Christ. It's about the lordship of Christ. There are many ways to describe, you know, the, the subject matter of that book. But it's simply saying that Christ was God in a human body. That's who he is. And therefore, when you are in Christ, the text is saying that there are certain aspects, there are certain features that will be de descriptive of your life in Jesus Christ. First, to have faith in Christ or to embrace Christ, the foundation of your life is going to be what is called gospel truth. Notice in this book, Paul just doesn't use the term gospel, but he often refers to the truth of the gospel because everything that you are hearing today about Christ is not the truth of the gospel. It is not the truth of the good news. And a Christ-centered life is based on the foundation of gospel truth. The second thing that you uh, would want to know that would encourage you even today to embrace Jesus and to engage in the recentering of your heart is the fact that a Christ centered life is a life of fullness. In other words, there is a fullness associated with living the life that God would have you to live. And that fullness is based on Christ sufficiency, not self-sufficiency, but Christ sufficiency. You need to understand that. You need to understand that all that God wants you to become, all that God wants you to do, you are not sufficient in, in and of yourself to do any of that. The Lord wants to make you sufficient to accomplish your dreams to accomplish your vision, to accomplish your ministry, to accomplish your goals. And that sufficiency, Paul says, is not in and of ourselves. It is the sufficiency that comes through the indwelling of God in your life. And so it is Christ's sufficiency. The third thing, uh, and that is the focus of a Christ-centered life, 
What is the focus of a Christ-centered life? It is knowing the risen Jesus. Knowing the risen Christ. Knowing him. Not simply believing in him. When you come to Christ, you come to Christ by believing the gospel. You come to Christ by believing what he says. Uh, embracing his truth. Embracing his plan. Embracing his purpose. But notice the focus of all of that. Is where you can get to the point where Paul says, I know him in whom I have believed. And I am now persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have entrusted into him against that day. And so the focus is knowing rather than simply believing. And then what is the fruit of it? The foundation is the, is the gospel truth. The fullness is Christ's sufficiency. The focus is knowing him and the fruit is his ministry. In other words, you will be able to accomplish, to will, and to do the very things that God has intended for you to do. So know this principle. A Christ-centered heart results in a Christ-centered life. A Christ-centered heart will result in a christ -centered centered life this whole issue of your salvation is about your heart in other words and and, and when you talk about being christ-centered you're simply saying being single single focused a single single focused life is what jesus was referring to in matthew the sixth chapter verses 22 and 23 Jesus made this statement. He says, if, he said, the eye is the lamp of the body, using a physical analogy. He said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, Jesus made that statement because he was, he was literally talking about the, uh, in other words, he was pointing, using a physical analogy to point to a spiritual truth. And he said, just as your eye need to be able to be focused, just as your eye need to be able to see, you have spiritual eyes. And your spiritual eyesight is literally your faith. And that faith has to be focused. You cannot have dual vision you know, and be healthy. So notice he says in the very next verse, uh, in application to Matthew 6, 22 and 23, he says this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some people want to soften that up and they say mammon. They talk about un, un, ungodly gain. You know, but the Bible simply says you can't have two masters. You've got to learn. The key to the Christian life is learning how to put your pursuit of your career. Learning how to pursue an earthly career, you know, with fervor and full energy and yet have all of that under one purpose, and that is to glorify God. You know, that's the key. And the Bible said if, if you don't learn that principle in your life, then you're going to be, you're going to have dual vision. And therefore, your whole soul is going to be full of darkness. And that's what this message then becomes uh, relevant. That is, how do I recenter my heart? How do I create the kind of vision that God wants me to have? In other words, Christ-centeredness means having a heart that is for God. The heart simply refers to the center of one's life. It transcends your feelings. It transcends your emotions. Uh, it tra in other words, it is often referred to and described in the Bible as bowels of compassion. 
you know, you, 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 you heard people often use the analogy, man, I really feel it in my gut. You know, I, I, I feel it in my bowels. You know, that's really a gross kind of analogy. You know, but it is a literally description of the depth, the depths of your feeling. And it is also synonymous in scripture with what the Bible refers to as the heart. The heart is at the center of your thinking, is at the center of the framework of your, of your mind. It is the high, the Greeks refer to it as the noose. It is the highest portion of the brain. The heart is where God reigns. It's where Christ reigns supreme and wants to be at the center and call all the shots as it relates to the ordering of your life. And so the heart, a heart for God, it simply means a heart for his desires, a heart for his people, a heart for his purposes. And that's what you're trying to do. That's what the endeavor. Now, understand this. You cannot do the. You cannot leave this building and say, I heard a message. Now I have a heart for God. Now, go ahead. It don't happen that way. It just don't happen that way. I wish it was. I wish that you could hear the message, come down and sign a card, and leave here and say, I got a heart for God. But a heart for God is something that God produces. When you cooperate with God's plan, when you cooperate with the principles and when you understand what that looks like, then you'll be able, you know, in the process of your spiritual growth and development, in the process of your spiritual learning, you will be able to take the description that I'm going to give you today and always measure yourself. Evaluate yourself by this measurement, by these principles, and know whether or not you have a heart that is catering toward God. Whether you're even in that direction. Are you following me? And so let's look at the principles of what it means to have a heart for God. What, what would be the case when my heart is recentered? Here is the first principle. When my heart is recentered, it will be spiritually passionate. In other words, I will develop a spiritual passion, a spiritual passion for the will of God. For the plan of God, for the purpose of God. Notice Paul uses in verse 1, you know, of Colossians, he says, I want you to know how hard. And what we're doing is using the expressions of the apostle in this writing and depicting these principles from a man, from a preacher, from a teacher, a leader who has a heart for God. And he's given a description of what this looks like. Notice he says, I want you to know how hard. I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. Friends, you need to recognize that to, de to be dispassionate about your life of faith, to be dispassionate about your relationship to God, to his people, to his purposes, is a distasteful, is distasteful in the mouth of God. To be unpassionate about what God has called you to do, to be impassionate about God's plan, about God's purpose in your life, is distasteful. Dispassionate faith is distasteful to God. Notice in Revelations where Jesus uh, said to the church at Laodicea, in Revelation 1 and verse 15 and 16, Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. The point is, friends, if you recognize that God wants you to be passionate, that spirit, being spiritually passionate is a goal is an objective of spiritual growth and development. When you recognize this, you will avoid a lot, of, a lot of pain, a lot of discipline that God can allow to come into your life in order to teach you passion, in order to make you passionate about what God's will is. And so when you go through this year, when you recognize where God wants you to be as it relates to your passion for God, you know, then you can experience a lot of great things that God has in mind. In other words, notice when Paul says, I have great agony 
about this thing in Laodicea. Great agony is, is, not, a call, is not caused by personal offense. In other words, great agony for the things of God is literally prompted by having a zeal for God's house. When things are not going the way that, the way that you know that they should. When things are not happening in the church the way that you know and God has shown you that these are the way that things should be happening, you ought to be passionate about it. You ought to be approaching your leaders. You ought to be approaching your preacher and saying, these are things that we need to do. We need to get on top of this situation. We need to get on top of our families. We need to get on top of our children's ministry. Get on top of our youth ministry. Get passionate about it. Because God expects you to. In other words, notice he talks about having unbound practical love for all the saints. The love that God wants you to have for the people of God, the Bible says, is an unbounded love. It's not just loving people of your own kind. It's not just loving people who look like you and walk like you, but it's unbounded. It's the love that God has for all of humanity. God wants you to embrace that love. So the point is, you will be spiritually passionate. The second description, the second description of a Christ-centered life, a Christ-centered heart, and that is it will be singularly purposed. There will be a singular purpose. And that's what I mean by uh, when you learn how to put everything that's going on in your life your parenting, your marriage, your career, your hobbies, all of these things coming under one banner, and that banner is to glorify God. And so notice what Paul says in, in verse 2. He says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. I want to stop right there, hold that up. He said, now my goal, that is the purpose of, of my life, the purpose of my ministry, the ultimate aim that I'm shooting for is to build up. You know, now Paul, uh, unlike most of us today, such as myself, Paul was not in ministry full time. He was committed to ministry full time. But Paul made his living from tent making. He would not even accept a salary because of his, because of his apostleship. He would not accept a salary from the church lest people would say he is starting this faith for his own benefit. And so Paul knew how to put his secular pursuits under one banner, and that is one goal, one purpose, and that was to build up the body of Christ. And so notice he said the goal, and notice how he describes the goal, the singular purpose, is a confident heart. He said that you may be encouraged in heart and united. Now, notice the two words encouraged and united in love. Now, what he's talking about here is their maturity. Because when they're encouraged in heart, that is, their heart is confident. Do you not know that when you're pursuing, when you're pursuing things pertaining to your life, that is, that is important to you. It may be your family. It may be a child that's wayward. It may be a job situation, and it's just stressing you out. You know what worry? Worry is simply the absence of faith. And when you recognize that everything that is literally about your life, God is in control of, when you begin to acknowledge and allow God to show you his control in your life, your heart will move toward stress, toward comfort. It will move from stress to comfort. And, every, and, and, and God has to continually do that for you. In other words, just because you get a comforted heart, you know, on one situation, it doesn't mean that stress ain't going to come back. Sometimes it come back the very next day. You have to cry out again. Lord, help me. But the idea, the idea of encouragement in this text He's talking about having a fully confident heart. That's what encouragement is. 
And then when a person is encouraged, they are able then to even get along better with others. He said, then as a result, you will be united together in love. When people are, when everybody's stressed out about everything, you go to a fellowship where everybody's all, all messed up, stressed out. You wonder when, when, when the dismissal, everybody just, they get, it, get out as fast as they can. They got everything else on their minds. You know, but the point is, the Bible says an encouraged heart, a comforted heart will lead to better relationships that you'll have with others. Isn't that right? He said, then you will be united together in love. And the reason I love this principle, and I'm just simply expounding this text, because there is a hint of clause in this passage that is a purpose result. There are sequential results of being encouraged and united in fellowship with others. There are sequential results. And that's why you see in that text, it says, so that. So that. What is the so that related to in this passage? He says, so that you can experience the richness of full assurance. In other words, when you're encouraged in heart, one of the results of that is having full assurance. And there are riches associated with having full assurance. Why is it valuable to have full assurance? Notice you see another so that. So that you can achieve complete knowledge of the mystery. Do you know what the mystery of the Christian faith is? The mystery of the Christian faith, the mystery of the Christian life, is Christ in you, is the resurrected Christ. The fact that the, Christ, that the Christian faith is not based upon a Savior that is dead and still in the tomb. That the, the one who died to save you, the one who died to deliver you, he is not in the grave, but he's alive today. And where does he live? He lives in your life. Why does he live in your life? To empower your life to guide you, to direct you, to give you the will and the ability to accomplish his will. That's the mystery of the Christian faith. And the Bible says it is that mystery that is your hope of glory. Whatever you seek to become, whatever you seek to do, whatever you determine your destiny by God's will to be, the mystery of accomplishing that of the hope of accomplishing that will be Christ in you. If you think that you need all, every resource associated with your destiny, and if you know where it's going to come from, your destiny is really not a faith, a faith objective. The point is that God is going to be the navigator. God is the one that's going to put people in your life. They're just going to show up. Isn't that right? And they'll show up at the right time. The time when you need this resource, God is going to make it show up. Can you imagine how much showing up God has done in this fellowship? Showing up. That's right. Showing up. And the point is that the Bible says that when you allow your heart to be comforted, when you allow that comfort to result in a relationship with others that's knitted together in love, he said the first result is that you're going to come to full assurance. The second result, what results from full assurance, is you will achieve what the Greek term says, epignosis. The word epignosis simply means full knowledge. Full knowledge. As long as you can't say, I know him in whom I believe. As long as you can't say, I've experienced the risen Lord in my life. That the resurrected Savior is active in my life. As long as you can't say that in testimony, friends, you don't have complete knowledge. God wants you to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. To know him. And then, what is the sequence? What is the end result of that, that next hint of clause? What is the next result? What, is, what results from experiencing the mystery of Christ? The mystery of the resurrected Savior. He says you'll have access to all hidden treasures of wisdom. That's a powerful thing, isn't it? All hidden treasures. There are hidden treasures of wisdom associated with knowing the resurrected Savior. 
Friends, that ought, that, 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 that ought to excite you. And what is the observable evidence? I want you to note verse 3. Uh, in verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 5, I want you to see the, the evidence. He said, for I am absent in the body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are. Uh, one translation says, your order, your good order. Do you not know one of the problems, you know, with the Christian, with the Christian church, one of the problems with the Christian community is simply disrespect for spiritual guidance and authority. If, every, if, if the church was ordered the way God would want the church to be ordered, that everybody, whatever the plan is for spiritual growth and development, everybody would rally to be a part of that. When they put up that, that QR code for people to register in, in the small group, people would rally, rally to be a part of a small group religion. Why? That's the direction that God has given for this ministry. And the point is, Paul says, when you have access to that mystery, when you have access to all treasures of wisdom and knowledge that God has planned for you, then I will be able to observe, even though I am not present, I'll be able to observe your order. Good order. Uh, and then verse 5, look at verse 5b of that text as we move toward a conclusion. He says, and how firm your faith in Christ is. That is, stability of commitment. That's another observable sign of a person who have obtained access to the mystery. A person who is experiencing access to all treasures of hidden wisdom and knowledge that's associated with the mystery of the resurrected Christ. The observable sign of that is, number one, good order, and secondly, Stable commitments. Stability of commitment. And then finally, the third characteristics of a, re, of a recentered heart, it will be securely positioned. Securely positioned. Notice verse 7, verse 6 and 7. Paul says, so then just as you receive Christ as Lord... Continue to live your lives in him, rooted, rooted. There is a such thing, people, there's a doctrine out there that is false doctrine called the, the eternal, they, they refer to the eternal security of the believer, but what it literally means in these denominational ideologies is once saved, always saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that a believer can depart from the faith. You know, God don't make nobody go to heaven against their will. If you don't want to go to heaven, you don't have to go. <laughs> That's right. You don't want to go to heaven, you don't have to go. <laughs> he's not gonna make he's not he's not gonna make you go against your will just because you obeyed the gospel years ago. The point is, the Bible said, but when you but there is a such thing as security in the faith, and that security in the faith is when you get to the point where your convictions are settled. Having settled convictions. There are some believers, they don't know what they believe. There are some preachers don't know what they believe. Every time they get in the pulpit, you're hearing something different. That's right. In other words, security relates to having settled convictions. Yes, we are growing in our understanding of everything, but there's a foundation. And the Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Settled convictions, verse 7. In other words, Paul says, having been rooted, built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. Now, notice he says being built up. You know what that simply means? And this is a, pre this, this is a participial. It's not a verb. It's a participle. That means you are being built up. That means you're in relationship with other Christians. You're receiving ministry. That's, that's what group ministry, that's what the calling is about, is where people are put in a situation where they are actually receiving ministry. They are being built up in him. 
They are connected. The principle is being connected relationally for the purpose of receiving the ministry. And then in verse 7, the latter part, and overflowing with thanksgiving. You know what overflowing means? An abundance. That is consistent praise. Consistent praise. God wants your worship and praise to be consistent. And not just consistent, but overflowing. Overflowing with thanksgiving. Friends, that's what it means to recenter your life. That's what it means to have Christ in a life. It simply means to have spiritual passion. It simply means to have stable, a stable purpose. It simply means to have consistent praise to God. I want you to stand on your feet at this time. You should want to experience all that God has in store for your life because it's free. Know that. It's free. What God wants to do for you, he's not charging you. He just simply, if you give, if you exchange, if you give your life for the life that I want to give, then what I'm going to do, you're going to develop Spiritual passion. You're going to develop singularity of focus. You won't be running off in all directions. You'll know that everything you're doing comes under that banner to glorify God and to build up other believers in the faith. That's what Paul said. My goal is to build up. And then you'll also know, you know, that you will achieve security. That is, you will be securely positioned in the faith. Securely positioned, your praise will be consistent. Your commitments will be stable. Your heart will be assured. That's what God wants you to be. Friends, what's your decision? Will you allow the Lord to reset, to recenter your life today? If you have never obeyed the gospel, then you've heard that Christ died for your sins. Do you believe that? Do you believe that message? Do you believe that he, was, that he died and was raised for your justification? Do you believe that message? Do you believe that that one who died was also God in a human body? That's what Christian faith, that's gospel truth. That's the foundation. He was not only fully human, but he was fully God. And you can acknowledge that today. And when you accept the fact, when you admit that you are not capable in and of your own self and your own resources to achieve the dreams that God put in your heart, if you admit that, you have come to faith. Because faith is simply no longer relying upon self, but transitioning that reliance to a savior. Jesus can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. That's what faith is. That's what repentance is. Repentance is, I used to rely upon myself, my education, my resources, my heritage. But now I rely upon Jesus. And all that he promises to do, I'm willing to accept that. That's repentance. And when you're willing to repent, that is transition your allegiance from self-sufficiency to Christ's sufficiency. Then you have to admit, you have to acknowledge him as God. Because if you acknowledge, it's simply saying, well, he's a good man. He's a, he's a prophet. He's a good, he's a, he's a, he's a good teacher. Friends, that simply means that he would be just as finite as you. He can promise but can't deliver. That's why the Bible says 
You have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. And when you make that confession, you open up doors of opportunity. You have to demonstrate that I actually believe that. And how do you demonstrate that I actually believe what I have confessed? By your initial obedience in how you receive his grace. He says, be baptized to belong to my family, to be born into my family. Be baptized for the remission of all your past sins. An obedience of faith that's based upon your faith that Jesus is not just Savior, but he's your Lord. Make that decision and do it right now as we sing a song of encouragement. Will you do it?
Thank you very much. We have two card responses, and, and then I have some uh, baptismal certificates I want to uh, give out. First, we have, having responded to the invitation, Cece. Cece, would you stand? Cece is asking to, uh, she's just asking for our prayers, that she may continue to be obedient to the spiritual principles uh, that she's learning in Christ, and she's also engaged in a support group ministry that takes place on Saturday evenings. Uh, she's one of the leaders of that ministry, and uh, we appreciate her so very much for all that she's doing. We're going to be praying, you know, that God will help you to be uh, endure uh, and to be consistent and continuous. May God bless you. Uh, this comes in from Sister Bryson, uh, Ann Bryson. She's asking for prayer for her nephew uh, and all, who's dealing with, you know, certain challenges, her cousin, Annette, uh, and to continue to pray for Nelda Hayes, who's uh, uh, in the hospital in recovery at this time. So we want to be praying for them as well. I want to ask Brother Davidson, if he will, to offer prayer for those who have responded to the Savior's invitation. Shall we bow? God, it's again that we, your children, stand before you, Father, in need of prayer. And Father, as we bring specifically our sister Cece, Father, she's asking you to, to strengthen her, to fortify her faith. Father, enable her to live a life where her faith resembles Christ being at the center. So Father, we ask your blessings upon her and Father, that you would use her Continue to use, continuously use her testimony, Father, of your grace in her life. And Father, our sister Ann Bryson, Father, who is, Father, asking and coming before you, Father, uh, on behalf, Father, of, of members and family members and, and members of the body, Father, that she's mindful, she, she's concerned for. Nelda Hayes asking that you would you would bless her, Father, that she is in the hospital in under seeking recovery. And Father, also her nephew, Father, uh, you know specifically, Father, the detail in both of these situations, Father, where your mercy and your grace is needed. Father, we know that you can because we've we've witnessed, we've seen. Father, you bring recovery in people's lives, in our lives. So, Father, we just ask always, Father, that you would grow our faith, grow our understanding of your grace, and, Father, we'll be, we'll be faithful to give you the praise and the glory. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we're praying. Amen. Amen. I want to acknowledge some recent baptisms. Uh, th that has occurred. One is one of our online uh, participants, online members, uh, who was who came from Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado, to be baptized here at the Reseda Church, and that's Sylvia Bryant Johnson. And I'm thinking I'm I'm relating this to the right person. There's no Sylvia Bryant Johnson in the audience, right? What are you saying, Margaret? Okay, that's it. That's who I thought it was, Sylvia Brand Johnson. Okay, and uh, I'm going to ask Ronisha Hughes to come forward. Uh, Ronisha, she was baptized on last Lord's Day. Uh, well, I'm not going to have you come up with that baby in your arms. <laughs> This is a baptismal certificate that memorializes what you have done in terms of obeying the gospel. Renisha is the one, when I talked to her after the uh, service, she was in the water, and I wanted to make sure that she understood fully what she was doing. She said, just exactly what you said. I want to shake off the shackles of any denominational experience, you know, in, in this obedience to the gospel. And so uh, we appreciate that, you know, sir, very much. Is Samson Hall present? Samson Hall, he's from uh, Moore Park, and uh, we're 
Uh, and what about a million nulet? Oh, okay, there you go. Amelia has been attending for quite some time, and she made a decision on last Lord's Day that she's going to put the Lord on in baptism. We appreciate that so very much. Uh, and all of those who surround her, we want to make sure that these people get connected to a small group. You know, so you're not presently in a small group. We're going to make sure you're in one before the end of the week. May God bless you real good. Uh, these are all that I have in terms of acknowledging our new members in the body of Christ. Dr. Winrow put forth a, a charge uh, of us last week uh, that on Wednesdays we will be in fasting and prayer from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we did start that last week, but we did not re-emphasize it, and I wanted to come and re-emphasize it. We will, in this sanctuary, from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. be in prayer. Every 15 minutes, supplication, thanksgiving, intercession, all of those concerns that you have that you send in to us, and we would like you to do the same. Fast and pray during that time for this congregation, for the goals that we have before us, the forum, and all of those things that we're seeking to do for God in this community in being salt, light, and leaven, uh, not only to the community, but to one another, to be an influence of one another. I don't know if Dr. Winrow has anything else to say, but I wanted to uh, emphasize that. You'll get uh, emails concerning it just as reminders, and we just want to be what God called us to be, and that was a house of prayer. Amen. We want to emphasize that the prayer theme for this week is centered around uh, Psalms 51, and we're going to emphasize the theme of confession. You know, just ask God to blot out all of your transgressions. Pray the prayer, recite the prayer of David in Psalm 51. Read it, read it every day and make it your prayer. And that will be, that will be so beneficial to you, you know, as you, as you seek to recenter your heart and get your heart ready for God's use at this time. Shall we stand? Psalm 51, uh, the theme of confession. Please bow with me for closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather here today, Lord. We thank you for the inspiring message brought by Brother Winrow, and we ask that you touch us in a way that we're able to share that with those that we come in contact with during the week. Lord, we ask that you keep us safe until our next appointed time. In Jesus' name, we ask this prayer. Amen. There's an announcement that needs to be made before, before you start gathering. Listen, 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 listen. Margaret has an announcement to be made. Come forward, Margaret. Let's pay attention. Actually, I have two announcements. The first one is just a reminder to all the ladies. We're meeting in the fellowship hall now, and lunch is being provided. All ladies, we want to talk about your participation in the upcoming West Coast Forum. So lunch is being served to the ladies that want to be a part of this forum. Also, I think Brother Jules mentioned last week that he would like to meet with all mothers. I don't know where they are meeting. Mothers of small children. They're meeting where? Chapel? All parents of small children. Uh, go to the same meeting. <laughs> yeah, just go to the same meeting and they'll work it out. <laughs> All women. <laughs>